Uh, this is the Meet the Scholar series, and this is Don Hambrick's show. I um, uh, want to introduce him a little bit, though. Uh, first of all, uh, Don is the Evan Pugh University Professor and uh, the Smeal Shared Professor of Management at the Pennsylvania State University. And I, I guess I didn't know this until we talked last week, but he also holds an emeritus position uh, at Columbia, which is where he was for many, many years before coming back to Penn State. Um, and in that regard, uh, Don is probably, you know, one of the few people in academia who gets the uh, privilege uh, of working at the degree where he got his PhD. He also got his PhD uh, at Penn State. Talk about that in a little bit. Um, he's held, you know, a number of officer positions um, in the academy over the years. Uh, he was a uh, chair of the SDR division itself at one time. He was also the president of the academy of management. And he has a really interesting uh, presidential address from that year. And if you've not read it, uh, I would uh, advise you or encourage you to do so. I believe it's published in AMR. Um, he's a dean of the fellows of the academy, um, won numerous awards from the academy, uh, distinguished scholar award, uh, distinguished educator award. He won our very own uh, SDR division Irwin award. Um, and he has, on top of all of that, he has four honorary doctorates and you can see them listed there. Uh, his research contributions, and this is where it's going to be uh, really <laughs> hard to get all of this in quickly. Uh, but he's best known as probably everybody on this call realizes as author and developer of the upper echelons theory and the related work on strategic leadership. Um, and in this work, he sort of spearheaded uh, the fields focused on top executives. He was one of the people that sort of spearheaded the fields focused on boards and how they influence firm strategy and performance. Um, he has over 130 uh, journal articles and book chapters, uh, five books uh, and edited volumes. And on top of all that, uh, has co-edited two special issues. Um, he has over 80,000 citations in Google Scholar. Um, and his H index is an astonishing 99. And if you don't know what that means, that means that 99 of his papers have been cited at least 99 times, uh, which is quite remarkable. Um, and then the last point on here um, is something that, you know, just really strikes me. It's something that I've always really admired about Don. Um, not, in addition to his great scholarly productivity, he's also a wonderful PhD advisor and mentor. Um, he's, uh, you know, sort of helped develop several notable scholars, some of whom are on this call. And, you know, those people continue to extend his legacy, continue to do good re research, continue to contribute to the field um, at their respective institutions. And, and we'll talk more about that in a little while, because I think that's a really important part of Don's legacy. And what we'll talk about in a little while. Um, but before we get there, um, I did have a couple of uh, beginning questions for Don. Um, and again, th thank you, Don, for doing this. And, uh, and these first few questions, I guess, are really so that we can get to know uh, Don the person. You know, I think we're all really familiar with your work, but to give us a chance to, to get to know Don the person. Um, so if we could start off, you know, maybe by telling us, uh, you know, where were you born? Where'd you grow up? Can you tell us a little bit about your family? Uh, sure. Let me just start, Michael, by saying thanks to you and thanks to Samina and uh, uh, the STR leadership and all of you who are with us today. It's a, uh, a treat, a real honor to, uh, to be able to share time with you. Uh, so I was, ra I was born in Pueblo, Colorado, uh, which is a steel town uh, known in the U.S. as the Pittsburgh of the West back then. My grandfather was a steel worker. Uh, and uh, I was delivered by the same doctor at the same hospital that, as my father. Uh, my mom and dad uh, met when he was on his way out of the military after World War II. And I like to say I was probably the very first uh, baby boomer ever born. Uh, I was uh, born in, in uh, early, uh, mid-46. Mid and uh, my parents moved uh, from the Carolinas where they, where they married back to, uh, to Colorado, to Pueblo, where I was born. And then we moved to Denver and had uh, really the, the quintessential middle-class post-war life, a uh, small little ranch house. My dad was, uh, uh, got his accounting degree at night uh, and became a junior accountant at a big railroad in Denver and uh, climbed. He eventually retired as the CFO of the railroad. So he was a, a great success story. But uh, it was, a, it, as I said, it was a quintessential middle-class uh, uh, upbringing uh, uh, of, of that era. 
and uh, our house was full of love uh, and uh, minimal tra trauma. Uh, I got my undergraduate degree from the University of Colorado, uh, moved east to graduate school, and uh, have lived in the east ever since. And uh, I like to say that Colorado kicked me out because I don't ski, uh, and I don't ski. But uh, 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 there's, uh, my mom is still alive, and uh, uh, we were planning to go back there this summer. Of course, didn't make it, but uh, hope to go back uh, uh, soon enough. But so that's that's sort of the story. You're mute, Mike. I muted myself. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask you uh, what you do for fun in a, little, in, a, in a little bit. I guess we know it's not skiing, um, but I'm talking about that. Can you tell us a little bit about your family now? Uh, so uh, we have a uh, daughter, a son-in-law, and a two-year-old grandson. And I was saying to Michael the other day on a call that uh, the silver lining for my wife and I amidst this uh, horrible pandemic is that uh, our, our uh, daughter and, and son-in-law and dear uh, baby Harrison have been living with us since March. And uh, so this is a precious time to, uh, to be around uh, uh, Harrison and, uh, and spend time with him. So, uh, so that's it. Uh, Claire, our daughter, is uh, in the TV industry. She's an executive with uh, one of the big uh, uh, cable network companies in the US. So actually, they have worldwide operations. In fact, she just got a big promotion to manage international relations for, uh, uh, for, for their networks. So, uh, so that's it. They're working remotely. And uh, they just broke the word to us that they are going to go back home in mid-August. Uh, once the students arrive here, it's going to be safer back for them back in New York than it will be here. <laughs> wow. Well, that's uh, that's the irony of ironies. Um, yeah. So the man who studies executives has a daughter who's an executive. That's awesome. <laughs> um, so other than chase two-year-olds around your house, what else does Don Hamburg do for fun? Well, I uh, uh, ordinarily love to travel with my wife, Peg. I uh, spent many years, decades, in fact, uh, having to travel a lot without her, which I really did not care for, but it was part of what I did. Uh, and and uh, since uh, Claire grew up, uh, our daughter, Peg can now travel with me, and I only accept uh, trips that I think would be fun for the two of us. Of course, right now, all travel is on hold. I, I read, I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm a voracious reader of nonfiction, uh, especially a little, bit, a little bit of fiction, but I like nonfiction social and political commentary especially. And uh, I, I was a lifelong uh, tennis and squash player until my knees gave out, but uh, uh, I, I, pl I played uh, college tennis and I was a teaching professional for a number of years. So that's, that's it, but, uh, uh, but family, is, family is my current passion outside of my work. I didn't know you were a college athlete. You still kind of have the uh, the tennis player's body, huh? A, a, a little bit, a, a little bit, as long as long as it's just from the 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 the, the shoulder up. <laughs> yeah. Well, in today's world, the only thing that matters is from the shoulder up. That's right. right. That's right. <laughs> so, um, so you know, uh, playing college sports. Um, then you know, from that point, did you go straight into a PhD program? Did you work a little bit in the interim, or what? Well, I uh, say I'll, I'll try to make it brief. I uh, uh, graduated from college in '68. Had my had paid my tuition deposit for the uh, MBA program at Columbia University, Columbia Business School, and 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 I got home from my college commencement, and waiting for me was my draft notice. Uh, so I was drafted into the U.S. Army and served in, Viet in Vietnam during our Vietnam conflict. Uh, I was in the infantry, so it was not a wonderful uh, period for me. Uh, but that all gave rise to eventually meeting my dear wife, Peg, and so on. But anyhow, 
uh, I actually applied for, I, I mean, I, I, I always, from the time I was a college junior or senior, and I really loved school, I loved academics, I, th I thought being a college professor might be pretty interesting. And of course, when you're an undergraduate, especially when you think of being a professor, you think of being a teacher. And I, so I thought that would be a cool thing to do. And so even though I was preparing to go get my MBA at Columbia, I also at the same time applied for PhD programs as a college senior. Out of the military, I did a bunch of applications to various things, including PhD programs again, but then went and got my MBA. Out of my MBA, I applied for PhD programs again, and finally, uh, after a stint in consulting and then in university administration, I applied for PhD programs again, and on the fourth time, finally pulled the trigger. But it was, it was, it was you talk about due diligence in being cautious and really careful in, in making this leap, because of course it's a, it's a major leap and getting a PhD in business is good for nothing except being a professor. So uh, it would be a colossal, uh, a colossal waste if you weren't sure you wanted to be a professor. And for the longest time, I wasn't sure. I, I thought maybe, but eventually it became clear. And uh, boy, talk about, uh, talk about what proved to be a wise choice for me. So in that regard, it's a, it's like you're in the mid seventies or whatever, when you're getting your PhD, um, you know, and at least as I understand it, strategic management wasn't really a thing, right? At that time. Um, so, you know, as you go back and you get your PhD out of all the things you can study, you know, what sort of got you to start studying things that later would be called strategic management or at least in the space of strategic management? Well, I guess a couple of things. My, my undergraduate degree, uh, was in business uh, and I actually had three majors. I majored in accounting, finance, and marketing. Don't ask me why or how. Uh, my MBA program, I majored in marketing and uh, what then was called planning and control, but took some so-called long range planning courses and then went into consulting briefly and uh, then came and then took a university administration job. And, uh, but basically I, I had exposure to all of these areas of business, uh, but, but was sort of interested in planning. Uh, I, was, I, I had a chance to teach what was back then called a business policy course here at Penn State. And uh, it kind of fell in love with that. So it's, it, it's a, but you're right, Michael, the field was not called strategy. Nobody could even spell the word, the word strategy. And uh, when I got my degree, there were, there were probably eight or 10 of us who were in the same boat. We were trying to uh, ride the crest on what seemed to be a potentially uh, uh, growing domain, but we didn't know. And, and to be honest, uh, nobody in business policy at the time, when I got my degree, nobody in, in business policy outside of Harvard at any other top school had ever gotten tenure. Mm. And some, a bunch had tried. Wow. Uh, a, a, bunch, a bunch had tried. So at Wharton, MIT, Northwestern, Columbia, Stanford, several people had tried to come up for tenure under the cloak uh, of business policy and they were all turned down. And of course, at that time, there was no SMS, there was no SMJ, there was no uh, uh, network. Uh, so it was, it was kind of a long shot and it was, it was, uh, it was fun, it was exhilarating, it was grim, uh, but it, of course, it all, it all panned out and, uh, uh, and we owe it to lots, lots of figures, maybe most notably 
uh, I would say Dan Shandell is way up there in terms of the people we owe uh, for doing a lot of the academic entrepreneurship to turn this into a real field. And thank God. And, it and, and, and by the way, rebranding re it, uh, rebranding the field from business policy, which is a, a dopey name, uh, to strategic management was part of our success story. That, that rebranding itself uh, helped it help quite a lot. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank God for Dan Shindell. And so I guess in that context, right, you know, in the late 70s or whatever, you had, you know, some of the work in sociology coming out that leaders don't matter, right? And you had, you know, some of the population ecology stuff was being written at that time that was not necessarily favorable to the, you know, what managers can do. Um, and you said, you know, it was kind of a hostile world for people trying to get tenure in this area, you know, at that time anyway. So in that context, what led you to start studying top managers? Well, uh, it's a, a two-part story, Michael. Uh, the, uh, actually, the, the origins of the Hambrick and Mason Upper Echelons article in 1984, the, the origins of that, the genesis of that, was a term paper that I wrote my very first semester as a PhD student for my very first seminar in strategy. And uh, like any of our research seminars as PhD students, we're obligated to develop a research proposal as part of uh, the course requirement. And I kind of was putzing around trying to figure out what, I'm, as a brand new PhD student, I don't know, up from, up from down, I didn't know what I was wanted to write about. And I came across this, this annual uh, Fortune uh, roster both for, back then, both Fortune and Business Week every year would do this annual roster listing a whole bunch of CEOs. In Fortune's case, it was the Fortune 500 CEOs and a whole bunch of data about these CEOs, uh, their age, their uh, where they went to college, what they majored in, where they were born, even back then their religion and on and on and on. And I became mesmerized by this list. I, my first question was, why would a reputable magazine do this? I mean, what's, what's, what's the point of this? Where, why would anybody be interested in, in it? It kind of dawned on me that, it, that maybe, it's, maybe it's important. And, and at least maybe a lot of their readers think it's important. And so uh, Anyhow, I, I, I became intrigued with the idea that these background characteristics of leaders uh, might affect what it is they do as leaders, or that, 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 that some of this somehow matters. I wrote it up for, for my professor, Max Richards, uh, who gave me, a, he gave me an A, but I could tell that he wasn't thrilled. Uh, and, uh, but he's a grumpy, he was a grumpy guy, so he wasn't thrilled with much of anything. Uh, but um, so anyhow, I, I followed, filed it away in, that was 1975. 1983, one of my, one of our doctoral students at Columbia is in my office, Phyllis Mason, and we're having a discussion about whether Having an MBA matters, and we're here. We're teaching MBAs. Does it? Does this? Are we affecting these people? Does, does it matter whether you have an MBA or not? And I started we were having a discussion, and all of a sudden, I remembered. I wrote this paper eight years ago. On kind of this issue, let me see if I can find this paper, and then I I root around in my file drawers, and I found the paper, and I asked Phyllis. Should we up update this paper and turn it into a journal submission? And she said, sure. And she went off and did a bunch of uh, uh, updating the literature and, and so on. And, uh, and so we submitted it in, uh, I guess, late 83. Of course, it was published in 84. It was the only paper in my entire career uh, that was published on the first submission. So it, uh, 
I guess it resonated with whomever. And uh, I guarantee you, I haven't had that happen since. <laughs> but I'm going to hang around until it happens again, by God. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but yeah, so that, that was the story. But uh, Michael, some, you know, something that uh, is lo very much lost to history, uh, because it deserves to be lost to history, is that m in my early pre-tenure days at Columbia, I did a whole bunch of strategy content research, mm -hmm. more conventional strategy content research. It had nothing to do with top executives. And uh, by the standards of the day, it was fine research and it got me tenure uh, and helped build my reputation. But the reason it's lost to history is that, that it was not by today's standards very good work at all. And uh, in my real passion, it turns out was uh, the study of uh, of top executives and you know, sort of the human side of, of strategy. So you said, uh, by the way, I love that AMR story, that that 1984 Hamburg and Mason story. I, I just love that story. It's one of my favorite stories from academia. I just love that story. Um, so, I mean, you said, for example, that it's lost to history because by today's standards, it might not have been, uh, you know, the best research by today's standards, but can you tell us what you learned in the process of doing it? Because if I recall, you know, a lot of those papers, you know, you did solo, right? Um, so you, you're having to carry a lot of the load. Can you tell us how you learned in that process and became a better researcher, you know, in that process that then helped you, you know, on down the line? Well, um, yeah, I, back then, uh, uh, col collaborations were not as common. Uh, Sole authored, sole authored papers were much more common. And so these papers that I'm talking about that are lost to history, that were my uh, Hambrick's brief uh, flirt with strategy content, uh, appeared in AMJ and ASQ and SMJ. So they were reputable journals and they, they met the standards of the time. Uh, uh, it was back in the day when uh, the standards for theory were not as high. And so that's one of the reasons that they're lost to history is that they tended to be uh, one-off empirical investigations and, and not uh, big contributions to theory. Uh, I learned about the discipline of, uh, of doing research. I learned about the craft of uh, dealing with journals and, and grumpy reviewers. I learned loads about uh, uh, the statist uh, statistical uh, state-of-the-art statistical analysis at the time. So, uh, I mean, I, I just learned immense amounts analytically and method methodologically that had escaped me or I just wasn't privy to as a doctoral student uh, mm -hmm. before. And so it, it all served its, served its purpose. By the way, it got me tenure also mm -hmm. at, in a department at Columbia. My department at Columbia, when I got there, uh, no one had gotten tenure in that department for 20 years. Wow. And so uh, the standards at Columbia Business School are very high. Uh, Columbia is a kind of a quirky place for, I won't get into that. Uh, I spend time on my psychoanalyst's couch talking about that. Uh, but basically, it got me tenure. It got me competing off offers at other top business schools. And so it served its purpose, and I learned a great deal in the process. That's awesome. But you guys don't know about those papers, and uh, and probably it's 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 for your betterment. <laughs> well, in that regard, I guess like the eighty four paper, you know, that you really just started focusing so much of your attention on top executives, right? Uh, at that point, um, and so while we're on the subject, and we've got junior scholars and maybe some doctoral students, I think, like on the call as well. Um, what kind of advice and counsel? right, would you give people at early stages of their careers um, that are looking to pick research topics, that are looking to develop a research program, and so on, because, you know, you, you definitely carved out your thing, right, and so uh, what kind of advice and counsel would you give to people looking to develop their own research agendas, and in terms of selecting topics and so on? Well, I guess a, 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 couple, of, uh, a couple of thoughts crossed my mind. First of all, Passion, passion, passion. 
if you don't have an intense zeal about what it is you're studying, you're not going to be able to put your seat in the chair day after day and deal with reviewers and deal with the crisis of confidence that always accompanies the task of writing. Uh, so you have to love the topic. I guess that what it, in turn what that means is, is that this is not something that you should try to be strategic about. <laughs> you shouldn't try to figure out what reviewers want, what the world wants. You got to figure out what you want. I mean, it, it has to be something that jazzes you. Uh, now, if, if you have the good fortune of having something that jazzes you and jazzes the world and jazzes reviewers, then all the better. But, but it has to be important for you is number one. Number two is I would, this, and this, this point I think is especially important for young scholars. Don't be driven by the literature. Don't look for holes in the literature. Don't tr try to reconcile incompatibilities in the literature. Don't spend more time reading. Spend more time looking at the world around you. <laughs> read the newspaper, read the blogs, read, I mean, uh, so phenomenon driven research is where it's at. It's where you have a chance to make a mark. Look for real world puzzles and ask, why is this the way it is? Uh, which, by the way, my puzzlement about Fortune magazine was kind of a dopey real world puzzle. Uh, why, why would Fortune magazine do this? Uh, that's, that's a trivial puzzle. But uh, I think uh, young scholars very often get enmeshed in the literature and they end up thinking that the literature is their only uh, tool. It's their only armament, <laughs> but the, the, the world is your tool and, and uh, the, broader, uh, the broader world of business and the broader challenges facing managers and, and uh, the puzzles that you see in the world of management uh, are what ought to draw your attention. Yeah, fantastic advice. So, I mean, finding what you're passionate about and not just being totally consumed with what other people have done before you, right? Um, but looking at the world around you. Um, and I think I've, you know, seen something you wrote one time, you're like, maybe read the literature just so that you know what's there, but you don't have to read every single paper that's ever been done, right, you know, on that topic, right? Yeah, I, I, I've said this to a bunch of my students over the years, because uh, I, I, I have kind of uh, an approach to, to projects that works for me. I look for these puzzles. I develop a research question. I develop some tentative hypotheses before I read anything. That's awesome. And then, and, then I, and then I go off or send somebody to go off to find out what's, what's the closest that's been written to what I've written here. I've got two pages here. Can you find what's the closest that emulates or uh, serves as, as, as a quasi-inspiration for what I've done here? given the fact that I wasn't really inspired by it, but now I need to consult it. Yeah. So I, that I, way kind of, I, I kind of use literature. Uh, I mean, now eventually you got to then enmesh, enmesh yourself in the literature and, and become a master of, of the body of work that you're drawing upon and trying to fit your work into. But I guess my, my key point for, for the people on this call is that I do that pretty late in the game. Hmm. Which explains why some of your papers have such independent thinking in them. <laughs> right? And I'm, no, I'm serious because, you know, a lot of times you're writing about things that people haven't written about before, or you're developing constructs that people haven't really studied a lot before. And part of that is because you're not just trying to imitate like what, you, what you're reading. I think that's really good advice and counsel uh, for people. So, um, 
in that regard, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, how your research has evolved over your career? I mean, we talked about the 84 piece, which was a lot of the, the demographics and you know, education and age and things of that sort. Can you talk about a little bit of, of, of how your work sort of evolved after that, you know, up until the point where you are now? And, and then and at the end of that, maybe what are you interested in now? Um, okay, real quickly, um, I, I, I told you that uh, pre-tenure I did a bunch of strategy content work, right. uh, which I enjoyed doing. I wouldn't say I was passionate about it, but I was quasi-passionate. I was more passionate after I turned to my interest in, in executives and leaders. I was exceedingly interested in, uh, I mean, I, I was, I leveraged stuff on demography for quite a long time because it was so convenient, so easy. Uh, that uh, was the found, early foundation for Upper Echelon's research, but its limitations are, are pretty clear. I was exceedingly interested in, in top management teams for a long time. Uh, did several projects that were both demography based uh, and demography based and then others that were uh, uh, interview and survey based. Uh, I ran, ran out of steam on that. I didn't lose interest. I ran out of steam because it just turns out that studying top management teams is really, really hard. It's very difficult because <laughs> you got to get data on eight or 10 people <laughs> or from eight or 10 people instead of just from one person. And, and so it's just, it, Godspeed to, to those of you who have a passion about top management teams and have a cool analytic and methodological ideas for pursuing it. But I kind of ran, ran out of, uh, ran out of steam there and became, then became interested in CEOs and CEO uh, psychology, cognition, personality, values, which all had been part of the original Hamburg and Mason uh, formulation, but didn't do much with it. And uh, clearly my work with Chatterjee on, on uh, narcissism was my first uh, empirical foray into uh, uh, CEO personality. My more recent work on uh, CEO political ideologies uh, uh, got me into uh, uh, work on CEO values in a way that I had written about decades before, but could never find a way to actually study uh, until we hit upon this angle. And uh, now I've become very energized about uh, uh, the role of leadership in CSR, non-market strategy, uh, the role of the firm in society, and the whole challenge of uh, capitalism saving itself uh, from itself and uh, what whether and how business leaders are going to figure out how to do this and how to contribute to the solution because uh, in the current trajectory at least in the u.s is going to have capitalism imploding uh, mm. and uh, as somebody who believes in capitalism and, and its, its, its glory and its strength, I know that on the current path is, is not going to be sustainable. We will either during Trump, because of Trump or after Trump, despite Trump, we're going to have a revolution. Hmm. So we're going to have a revol revolution and uh, business people better figure this out and uh, find a way to help uh, fend off uh, the demise of the system. And, and so I'm, I'm very interested in the role of, of, of leaders in being able to identi uh, identify this problem, diagnose the problem, contribute to the resolution of the problem, and so on. So I, and my, some of my work uh, right now is, is on non-market strategy, CSR, uh, and so on. So what do you think of the role of academia? And this kind of speaks to another question you and I talked about, about where the strategy field is going. What do you think about the role of academia or, you know, the strategy field in that conversation you just mentioned? 
because right? we're seeing it, you know, on the front page of The Economist and we're seeing it, you know, uh, every day in the news, there's this kind of backlash, right, against capitalism. What do you think the strategy field's role in addressing that is? Um, I'd like to think that it's substantial. I, I mean, I, I think that we have a role, a role to play. We understand, uh, we understand market forces, we understand uh, capitalism, uh, but we're, uh, we're enlightened, we're, 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 multi, we're multifaceted, I think, in our views. We have multiple perspectives. So I think, I think that we have something to contribute, absolutely. The broader question you're raising, Michael, torments me, and that has to do with the role of academia in much of anything today. Mm. There is so much skepticism about science and about academics these days from all quarters. It's, it's just tragic. I, I have no idea how this happened. Uh, that I, I think that, that scientists have been largely sidelined or silenced or, and if not explicitly discredited, they are, they're subconsciously discredited. And it's, it's a source of great pain. Of course, my pain is minor compared to the pain that must be felt by renowned climate scientists or renowned epidemiologists. Can you imagine how much pain they feel? Uh, and what's going on, and uh, so I, I don't know. I, I, I really, uh, I really am, am saddened by uh, uh, how, how, how academia has been sidelined in the last, uh, not just the last three and a half years, but probably the last uh, uh, five to 10 years. Do you think that there's anything that we've done as strategy scholars over the years that's contributed to the problem to some degree? I, I don't, I don't know what it would have been. I, yeah. I, I'm, it's possibly staring me in the face and I'm also partly uh, one of the chief culprits in, and not just not sure. Yeah. Yeah. The reason I was asking is because when, you know, when we read these commentaries sometimes in the journals that, you know, a lot of people point the finger and say, well, you're focusing too much on financial performance and you're focusing too much on this, you're focusing too much on that. And, you know, I don't know, we're strategy scholars, right? We, that's our question is financial performance uh, historically. Um, and so th uh, that was the reason I was asking the question because a lot of people do point fingers at us. Um, and uh, that's the reason I was asking. Well, uh, pivoting just a little bit, I wanted to make sure that we gave like enough time here for, um, and I think that question, what you just raised, I think other people are going to be asking that in the chat box in a minute. I think it's going to come back up. Uh, but I wanted to pivot. I want to make sure that we had enough time uh, before we get to the open portion uh, of the interview. I mentioned this when we went through the bio, but one of the things that I've always admired about you is the students that you produce. Loads of them um, that all do good work. And, and I'm... I wanted to ask you about your philosophy and sort of approach to mentoring doctoral students. Um, and the reason I want to ask you is, is, is one, you're obviously very good at it, uh, but, but also it's not something that we're ever like really taught in graduate school, right? For obvious reasons, and we're doctoral students at that time, but there's not a lot of formal training on this. Or call a lot of PDWs on this, or articles written in the journals on this, or whatever. But it clearly is important um, training the next generation of students. And so I just wanted to ask you a little bit uh, about sort of your philosophy and, and your approach uh, to mentoring doctoral students. And, and if you say anything, you know, that Craig doesn't like, then I, you know, Craig's got Craig's got the uh, the leeway here to, to to raise his hand and start complaining. But but in all seriousness, can you talk to us a little bit about how you approach mentoring doctoral students? Um, I'll 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 try. Um, the reason I say that I can only try is that. I've concluded that a great, if I've had any success, a lot of it's because of the caliber of people who somehow come under my wing. 
uh, coupled with some kind of tacit uh, knowledge that I have. It's very tacit. I, I would have a hard time writing an article about my secret sauce. I, I just don't know, I'm not sure what it is. But let me try, Michael. You know, first of all, uh, I've always, uh, ever since I worked with my very first PhD students uh, in, in the mid 80s, I've always loved it. I, it's, I've, I've viewed it as my life's blood, uh, as a, a source of great inspiration, a great, a great energy. Uh, and it turns out that a whole bunch of academics don't feel that way at all. I was flabbergasted at Columbia to keep running into colleagues who said they have no use for doctoral students mm. and wouldn't want to work with one uh, ever. <laughs> And boy, I just couldn't get my head around that. Like, where, where's that coming from? How could that be? Because it works so well for me. So it's, it's not for everybody. Uh, and you've all heard the old saw, the only thing worse than no doctoral students is bad doctoral students. Uh, so they, they can be bad. <laughs> they, can, they can be grim. Uh, but they, so, so for me, it's been my lifeblood. And I've, I've always thrown myself into it. I, I, I view it as a, uh, as a, uh, uh, an intimate relationship, uh, one where uh, we're teaching each other. We have a chance to, uh, to really make a difference together. Uh, and, uh, and I take, I, and I'm very hands-on, I'm very hands-on with doc doctoral students. I mean, and a lot, by the way, a lot of doctoral mentors who have good success are quite hands off. Uh, you know, uh, come back, come and see me when you think you have something to talk about, <laughs> or let's meet once every six weeks or whatever. So I'm not like that. I, 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 I'm, uh, I'm in your face uh, all the time. And I'm also a nag. I'm a real nag. And uh, if you, uh, uh, if you uh, haven't been showing up recently I, or delivering stuff, I nag you, and uh, and so on. And and uh, so I'm. I don't want to leave it on that note. That's a pretty uh, cynical <laughs> note, you know, be, being an egg. But uh, uh, but when I think about, I won't even I won't even name names because I could easily omit uh, some of my really cherished. Uh, uh, cherished former students. Uh, but when I think of, of, of all these people, uh, I view them as long-term investments, which is to say long-term investments for the field, long-term investments for me. They, they you know, uh, these people contribute to my CV for years afterwards because <laughs> it's an intimate relationship. It's a long-term relationship. Uh, and I'm now at a point in my career where I don't care about my CV. I'm totally motivated by helping young people start their CVs and learn the craft of high level uh, refereed research, which is a, is a complicated craft. It's very, very hard. And so for me to work with a young, per young person on these fronts is how I get my kicks. <laughs> Awesome. And, uh, and so uh, uh, for me to work with a doctor student today is not at all instrumental. I, mean, I got nothing to gain. It's, uh, it's to, uh, it's to uh, help them blossom and uh, help generate the next generation of thought leadership for our field. So you mentioned something there. So I'll take that question and flip it on its head a little bit and say like, bad doctoral students or good doctoral students. I think there's a lot of doctoral students on this call, I think. I think being a doctoral student itself can be a skill. Right? In other words, like in, in the sense of like, what makes a good doctoral student for you, Don? You've obviously had a lot of them, right? What makes a good doctoral student? Obviously, you know, you know you've got smart people, you know, working for you and things like that. But, but what are the soft skills that make a doctoral student a good doctoral student for you? Um, 
Well, it, yeah, intellectual horsepower is is right up there. But but let's call that kind of table stakes, and everybody who's admitted to a PhD program at at Penn State or Columbia, where I've been, is going to be is going to have a pretty high IQ. So beyond that, it's all in it's all in work habits. <laughs> Work habits, work habits. The ability to uh, execute, the ability to uh, to deliver stuff as promised. Uh, it's it's work habits, it, it, totally. Uh, writing is important, but writing is something that comes that people get better and better at during their studies, and so I don't expect to see that on day one, and that's not necessarily a, a, a gift that you have to have at the outset. But work habits uh, are far and away the most important thing, keeping promises uh, on deliverables and uh, your contribution. These kinds of things are, are important because that I can't, I can't, I have a hard time teaching you that. Either you, you got it and your parents put it in you or they didn't. <laughs> Uh, so that's my best shot, Michael. Sure. A work ethic and crazy reliability, right? Not making you have to nag them, <laughs> right? You know, uh, would be some stuff that comes out of that. So, you know, with, with a few minutes left in this, in the sort of Q and A or, or our Q and A portion of this, I, I want to make sure. Um, and, uh, and by the way, to draw your attention, um, a note was just put up for everybody who's on the call. If you have questions, I uh, put them in the chat box and, and I can be looking at them uh, when we get to that portion. So if you have some questions right now, go ahead and put them in there. But, you know, sort of at the end of, of our talk here, Donna, just simple question. What is next for Don Hambrick? Uh, well, <laughs> Uh, sh sh short term, uh, and a, a real preoccupation is that I'm, I'm I'm going into the MBA classroom in six weeks. <laughs> Penn State is reopening, and uh, I'm going to teach face to face with my mask and my shield and as much protective armament as I can muster, and uh, and I'm going to give it my best shot, and I'm looking forward to it. And I know that the students uh, are. Uh, after last spring's uh, uh, frustrations. And so we'll see, we'll see. And uh, I'm, also, uh, I'm also going to throw myself into getting Donald Trump defeated in Pennsylvania. Uh, that's going to be a major uh, activity for me over the next uh, three months. And uh, so I've got some short-term goals. <laughs> And, uh, and my uh, longer term goals, uh, who knows? Uh, we'll see. Uh, as I said, I've become very energized about, uh, uh, about capitalism, the role of, of the firm in society, uh, the role of leaders in uh, societal discourse, and, uh, and so on. So that's, that's where my uh, research, uh, some of my future research is going to be. But I will also say, I mean, I think the, the, the subtext of your question, Michael, is how much longer am I going to hang in there? And, uh, and I didn't I, mean to imply that. I have, I, have no, I, have no plan, I have no plans, I have no plans to retire. I, I still love what I do. And uh, somebody a few weeks ago came to me and said, Don, the, the dean is wondering how much longer you'll work. And I said to my friend, will you go back and tell the dean that all he needs to know is that I go to the gym every day. <laughs> <laughs> and, he can, and he can take it from there. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. You should be able to work as long as you want to, sir. You've earned it. Um, so, in a, in a minute, I've, so some questions have already come in here, um, and I've got maybe one more that I want to ask you, but I can save it to the very, very end. Uh, some questions have already come in here, and so we do want to do uh, 
the um, you know let the audience ask you questions now and you know if you're in the audience and you've submitted a question I call your name maybe it'd be better if you ask Don directly um, uh, rather than me being the one to, to ask all the questions so hopefully you're still listening uh, if you put one in um, yeah, I, I, I would I would welcome hearing directly from from each of you who have questions absolutely good let's do that uh, and but before we do that I think that the STR division wants to take a picture uh, of these zoom calls um, and so if if your screen is hidden right now uh, if you could turn it on so we can get a picture of everybody um, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna do I'm gonna ask everybody to stand up so that we can see if you're as dressed up from the shoulders down as you are from the shoulders up I'm just kidding I'm gonna do that <laughs> half of us are probably in shorts um, but uh, but in all seriousness I guess we're all on uh, you know, is this good? Can you do the picture for us and let me know when we're done? All set? Photo made? All good? Excellent. All right. Um, now we all wonder what we looked like in the picture. Did we have some funny expression on our face or, or what? Um, uh, so, um, question came in uh one one right off the bat um from kristen uh is it faile f-a-i-l-e kristen yeah there you go uh you had one of the first ones that were sent in um and so kristen floor is yours um, my question is in your opinion what does the future of upper echelons research look like what does the future of upper echelons research look like uh kristen where are you located University of Texas, San Antonio. Great. Uh, okay. Uh, so what does the future of upper echelons research look like? Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure, Chris, whenever people ask me about where is the field headed or where, 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 where uh, upper echelons is going, I have a hard time. I, I don't have a very good, good crystal ball. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, uh, I think that we will probably have uh, a resurgence of interest in top management teams because I think that's that's been dormant largely for the last ten years, but it doesn't need to be and shouldn't be. There's loads of un unanswered questions. And it's going to require some clever methodologies and clever uh, access to uh, to senior teams, but it, it can be done. So I think senior teams. I think there's going to be a continuing uh, great uh, interest in governance. I think uh, the role of boards uh, have be has become. Uh, more important, uh, people are more aware of uh, all of the uh, all of the roles and effects of boards. By the way, one one area of research that I'm doing right now, I've got two projects right now on uh, activist hedge funds and their effects on corporate governance. Uh, so this is something that's very much in my mind. Uh, and Kristen, I'll just put in one more plug for uh, the effect. The, the influence of senior leaders on non-market strategies and on societal outcomes. Thank you. Um, so uh, following up on that, there is a question in the chat box that the person would like me to maybe ask it for them. Um, related to that, I would love to hear what Professor Hambrick sees as the future of CSR research. I know you don't like projecting the future, I get it, but yeah, yeah. Um, CSR research, CSR, the role of, of firms in society. So I, I think that CSR might end up being an antiquated label, might end up being an antiquated concept. Hmm. Because we'll think more broadly about the the the, the, the role the role role of firms in society. Um, by the way, I don't. I don't know whether I have it. I had it here earlier. Uh, I was 
doing email with Ruth Aguilera, who's on, on the call today. And I was mentioning to Ruth uh, a, a book I just read, which I encourage everybody to consider. It's called Transaction Man. Transaction Man, the, the author is Nicholas Lehman, L-E-M-A-N-N, Lehman, L-E-M-A-N-N. Uh, but it's it's basically it's a it's a, a, a history of uh, sort of the purpose of the firm and political economy in the U.S. and uh, a discourse about uh, about uh, uh, corporate governance and uh, and so on. And uh, I'll just I'll leave it there. You can look up reviews of it, but uh, but I think that's that's my best answer. I'll I'll just leave it there. By the way, I'm even though I developed this interest in uh, CSR, I don't come close to being a CSR scholar. So I, I'm 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 not probably the person to ask about uh, the inside inside out of uh, of of the CSR. John Bundy's on the call, and he he would qualify uh, to as providing good answers to that question. <laughs> as would others on this call. So uh, while we're still in this space of, um, you know, talking about the field and uh, the state of the field and the state of upper echelons and some of the related work that you're doing right now, uh, Daniel, uh, is it Sung? Yes. Had a question? Yep. Sure. Um, so I just, Michael said, it's kind of a probably related question. Uh, but do you, Don, uh, I hope you're doing well, by the way. Um, do you see any promising opportunities uh, in terms of upper echelon theory being integrated with other uh, well-known theories um, you know, that we are familiar with? Or do you just think, uh, as you mentioned it earlier in the talk, that uh, pretty much that answer comes from you know, whatever phenomena that you're looking at? Uh, well, first of all, uh, hi, Daniel. It's great to see hey. you. Dan Daniel's one of my uh, my co-authors as well. Uh, and, uh, oh, I, I think there's plenty of opportunities for uh, uh, upper echelon theory to be linked to, to other theories. Uh, upper echelon theory and agency theory mm. is, a very, is a very sensible combination. Uh, agent, uh, upper echelons theory and resource-based view uh, is a very sensible combination. Uh, top executives as, res as resources. Uh, so I could, I could go on, but those are, those are two that especially come to mind. Now, what I've become intrigued with and I've actually become pretty good at is linking upper echelons theory with uh, a whole bunch of uh, uh, Behavioral and psychological theories, and uh, and I'm I'm working uh, right now on on a project on CEO succession, uh, and uh, and uh, decision making biases that boards fall victim to, in making decisions about uh, selecting new CEOs. So yeah, so upper echelon theory is. Uh, is elastic and it's not an island. <laughs> it's uh, it, it, it's uh, it's adjacent to and ought to be integrated with lots of uh, lots lots of sister sister perspectives. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, so real quick, it looks like we had an error on the photo. So uh, if we could do, uh, if everybody could turn their their uh, videos back on. Hey, Michael, they we got it. it. Oh. And uh, and we'll do it again. So if you want to count down three, two, one, and then we'll do it. You ready? So we got done this time. All right, all good, outstanding. Thank you. Uh, Sarash Asad had a uh, really interesting question that I kind of wanted to ask you earlier too. Um, since you brought it up. So I'll let Sarash, are you on the call still? Yeah, hi, uh, Don. Thank you so much for the talk. It was really, 
really interesting. Um, you mentioned that you're a voracious reader and I was just wondering what's your favorite book and what are you currently reading? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I would I want to venture what my, my favorite book is. Uh, um, Oy, 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 that's a that's a hard question. Um, yeah, um, I agree. <laughs> so you can just tell us what you're reading currently. Uh, I just read a fascinating book. It's called Fan Fantasy Land, and Fantasy Land is a a, a, a uh, it's an intriguing book about the about the I'm not sure I buy the thesis entirely, but it's about the extreme gullibil gullibility of Americans mm. uh, over the centuries. Okay. <laughs> over the over the centuries, Americans have fall uh, have fallen victim to all sorts of scams of various types, religious scams, political scams, P.T. Barnum kinds of scams, and on and on and on. And the reason I'm not sure I believe it is I'm not sure that America is any more extreme in this regard than some other uh, cultures or civilizations. But it's a very cool book. It's a tremendous book. Uh, it's a real eye-opener about all of the ways, uh, by the way, academics fall, uh, uh, I mean, there's one or two chapters about academic scams and about how, uh, and actually this goes back to uh, the discussion we had 15 minutes ago about whether uh, academics have uh, shot themselves in the foot uh, in terms of uh, their believability uh, with the broader public. But so uh, Fantasyland is a, is a fun book to look at. Thank you. I will. Have a look. <laughs> and don't forget transaction, don't forget transaction man too. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, then I've got some, uh, some doctoral student um, questions here. Uh, and one of them, again, it asked me to maybe sort of ask the question for them. Um, but it's talking about like, for doctoral students, like selecting topics, the person said that, you know, they got advice and counsel from one of their advisors that said, hey, you need to be focusing on theory. Right. And, and then, you know, some of what you said earlier, uh, you were talking about, you know, maybe like more phenomenon driven uh, and, and, and looking for novel topics. And, the, and, and the person said, uh, you know, it seems like focusing on just like novel phenomenon all the time could be a little risky, that's what they think. So could you talk maybe a little bit about the balance between theory and basically the world around us, so to speak, uh, whenever we're looking at uh, research questions and research topics, especially for, for doctoral students who are you know, early in the game? Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I have a very definitive answer. Uh, I, first of all, you, 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 you have to, uh, you have to get your advisor's buy-in. So you have, you have to do something that your advisor uh, is advising you to do. And so you, you, you can't, you can't say to your advisor, well, Don Hamburg says I should do this. <laughs> Uh, that's not that's not going to work. Uh, so you have to you have to humor your advisor, and your advisor probably knows a bit about what they're talking about. And dissertations, I mean, it's, dissertations are complicated because for a for somebody doing a dissertation for a doctoral student, it's it's the be all and end all. It's how you want to make your mark. It's how it's the basis for your job talk for getting a job. And so the stakes are pretty big and they seem, they, the stakes seem massive, but the key thing is that this is your first research project. It's not gonna be your best. And you basically just have to get it done. 
And there's an old saying that the only good dissertation is a done dissertation. And, and so uh, this is, this, you want it to be bold, you want it to be provocative, but perhaps this is a time in your career where you ought to just execute and do something that is pretty interesting for you and you think will be pretty interesting for the field. It, it, it fits into a nice theoretical stream and your advisor will like it. So, so here I am backpedaling on my earlier advice when it comes to dissertations. By the way, I, I mean, you know, keep in mind, I actually, now that I, now that I, now that I think about it, I'm not being insincere at all. Keep in mind that my, uh, my, that, uh, my big bold idea about executive background characteristics, I put into a file drawer for seven years until I was at the point that I had tenure. <laughs> and then I could do something gutsy and bold and create mm -hmm. my own theory. But you can't create a theory from scratch and do something you know, wild and crazy as a dissertation. It's at least you could, but that's pretty risky and you're in, and I, 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 I'm not sure I would advise it. I think a little uh, subtext to that and what Don was talking about that I think it's good for like the, the junior scholars to hear and the, uh, the doctoral students to hear as well as, you know, he had this paper that, you know, kind of revolutionized the field and he, he thought of it as a doctoral student. So just because you're a doctoral student doesn't mean you can't have good ideas. You know, at the same time, uh, you're sort of green and sort of raw, right, as a doctoral student, that you don't quite know what you're doing yet, right? So it's a balance between not discounting yourself simply because you're new, um, yet um, and, and realizing that you might have good ideas, yet also realizing that you're green, you're new, and you need to, you know, take advice and counsel from those who know more of you or know more than you. So I just think it's really fascinating that this really, really good idea was written when he didn't really understand the field yet. And I don't think that's by accident because he was less sort of closed in or boxed in by what he was already reading. Um, and I think, remember that, but at the same time, you don't go to your advisor and say, ah, you don't know what you're talking about because I'm new and that's not, it's nonsense. Um, but I do, I, I do want to encourage doctoral students to, you know, to not think that you can't contribute to the field uh, simply because you're new. Um, at the same time, don't be a jerk about it <laughs> um, because you are still learning. Um, Samina had a really good question um, in that regard. Uh, and right before she left, she said, I'm just going to read it. Uh, because it's, uh, she put in the chat box, she said, Don, you have probably written many tenure letters and done many evaluations. What advice would you give assistant professors as they work on their pipeline and approach tenure review? Um, I, write, I write a lot of those letters. Uh, I, I have... Uh, for decades. Uh, and so, uh, and I consider it uh, a high responsibility. It's, it's an important part of what we do. Um, I'm not sure I have anything very, very uh, unexpected to say. Uh, it's, when, 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 when I look at a, at, at a tenure dossier or, or a, a record of uh, somebody coming up for tenure, uh, you're, you're looking at uh, evidence of high standards and especially evidence that the person has uh, a real appetite for research and that they'll continue doing research uh, forever, or at least for a while. Um, um, so quanti quantity of productivity, quality of productivity. I, I read the papers uh, that are submitted as part of a dossier. Uh, you're looking for coherence. 
which is to say a programmatic uh, package of research, not a bunch of one-off uh, opportunistic uh, papers. Um, so I'm, I'm not, I, I fear that my answer is not very provocative, uh, but it's what I think we all have been taught to look for, and it's what I look for. I think it's a really good answer because you mentioned a few things. It's not just the quantity of the of the papers, although they, that needs to be there, but it's also the quality and that your letter writers probably are going to read your papers. Um, so you know, don't be putting nonsense out there. Um, and the coherence um, that you know you do have a research stream of some kind, and it's up to you a lot of times as the junior scholar to define what that research stream is for the person who's writing the letters. Um, but sometimes you need to tell them, right, how all of this fits together. Um, and then the last thing I think, you know, Don mentioned at the very beginning of that answer, you know, a lot of times universities are looking to reduce their risk of giving you tenure, you know, and so he's looking for not only, you know, what you have done, but your momentum, where you're going, you know, because one of the worst things that could happen to the university is they give you tenure based on your research and then you quit. Right. And now you're almost a liability for the next 25 years. Right. So they really want to say, are you passionate about your research? Can you do good research? Are you going to keep doing research? Right. You got to you got to communicate that, I think, uh, to your letter writers and frankly, to the people in your department, um, because I have heard about people being denied tenure, not so much based on what they had done, but because their pipeline was virtually zero and they had made comments, not very wise comments, but they had made comments, you know, about how they weren't going to do research anymore after they got tenure. It's like, you know, don't do that, you know? So you've got, that's part of your, your deal in, in framing yourself uh, in your package for your letter writers and for your university. And so I think it's a really good answer um, that he gave. Don, I, 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 told, I told you I thought this issue might come back up, um, uh, the, uh, the capitalism and uh, uh, issue. Um, I wanted to have, uh, Xavier uh, Martin asked it himself, but he said he's got limited bandwidth, so he's not quite sure if he can plug in with the video. So, although um, I'd like him to be able to ask it, I'll ask it for him. But again, uh, I think I'm going to read it virtually verbatim here. Um, I would like to hear your thoughts about corporate leadership and boards um, with all the wisdom that you've gathered over the years. And here's the crux of the question. At this point, do you deem executives to be more part of the solution or part of the problem with current capitalism? And what about boards? Interesting. Well, first of all, hi, uh, Xavier uh, is a dear friend. And so I'm disappointed that I don't get to see his uh, smiling face in person. Uh, and this is a great, it's a great question. Uh, so are business leaders part of the problem or part of the solution? And I think that it's it's a bit of it's a bit of both, uh, absolutely a bit of both. And and I think that business leaders themselves are a bit torn. Business leaders are not homogeneous. Uh, I, I spent my whole career uh, based upon the premise that uh, business leaders uh, are vary. They exhibit variance, and they and they they have varying thoughts. So I, I don't know, but I, I, I want to raise one interesting observation. I, I find this, this observation super provocative, and it'll take me three or four minutes to unveil it, but I hope you find it interesting. This, and this has to do with, with uh, a little inquiry that my, my friend and co-author Tim Quigley and I uh, undertook a few a few weeks ago. We did, we've decided to put it on hold, but and I hope none of you steal this idea. Well, it's but, recorded, so we know who's on the call. But uh, but uh, here here's the genesis of the idea. All of you in America, and maybe elsewhere in the world, will recall that last August. The Distinguished Business Roundtable, which consists of the 300 CEOs of America's blue chip companies, issued 
an emphatic proclamation announcing that the purpose of capitalism in America, the purpose of the firm, is to treat all stakeholders in a balanced, equal way. This was provocative because 20 years earlier, the Business Roundtable had issued a proclamation emphatically announcing that the purpose of the firm was to maximize shareholder wealth. So this is a complete change of their official stance and all but five of the members of the Business Roundtable signed the proclamation And news of it appeared on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and on and on and on. It attained incredible visibility. It was a very big deal in America last August. Big change from these business leaders about what the purpose of the firm is all about. So Tim and I had this idea. Well, over the next few weeks, every one of these CEOs is going to have their very first quarterly conference call with investors and investment analysts. Be interesting to see how they talk about this big change in the purpose of the firm with a constituency that has a lot at stake regarding this change, right? So we have 250, I forget the number, but let's say 250 of these CEOs are gonna have conference calls over the next few weeks, their very first conference call. You all know that a conference call consists of prepared remarks by the CEO and then Q&A, right? Okay, here we go. Of all of those CEOs, how many in the first conference call mentioned the business roundtable proclamation in their prepared remarks? The answer is zero, as in zero. Supposedly a big change in corporate America, supposedly a big change for these firms themselves, but one of the most visible opportunities to drive the point home wasn't mentioned by a single CEO. Okay, so how many investment analysts listening to nothing being said, and by the way, all of these investment analysts had read this proclamation on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and so on, so everybody's aware of it in the world of business in America. How many investment analysts asked about it? Mm. The, answer, the answer is zero. Wow. Namely, everybody involved to knew that it was bogus. Mm. <laughs> These CEOs are under great pressure from the rising tide of discontent it, by young Americans especially about capitalism. And they thought they would do something kind of cool to cool things down. <laughs> but it was ceremonial, it was probably phony. And if you, if you were gonna advise a business leader about how to announce and unveil and then drive home a real big change, you certainly wouldn't say when you have a chance like your next conference call, don't say anything about it. Mm. <laughs> you would not do that. They, they didn't mean it. So I, I think many of them know that change has to happen. Many of them want it to happen know that it's going to happen and that, and that they are in a position to help engineer it in a way that maximizes 
the favorability of the outcome for all involved, society and for firms that, and for uh, and for capitalists and 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 so on. Uh, so I'll I'll stop there, Xavier. Uh, when you and I have a chance to have a beer or a wine together, let's let's talk more about this. But uh, Michael, don't you think this is interesting? I think it's fantastic. I think it's, I was hanging on every word you said there. <laughs> I think that's, that's just, fantastic. Just so really, really, it's just really yeah. now. I, I part of me wanted to do a paper on this, uh, and now we can't because. Corporate America can now say that the reason that they're not doing anything behind this business roundtable in initiative is because of the pandemic. And so I think that's a confounding factor right now. But I think it was a, a symbolic ceremonial initiative to try to deflect or to basically try to buy time. These corporate leaders were trying to buy time through this proclamation. So what do you think? Them. What do you think it's going to get to take to get them to take it seriously? Don't, I'm not sure. Well, I mean, by, not not sure. More and more I mean, social unrest around them. I guess when the investors start taking note <laughs> to some degree, and the hedge fund managers start asking questions and. Yeah, you, yeah. By, by the way, this also ties into CSR and it, it, it takes, takes us in, in, in enlightened leaders and so on. But um, as I told you, I've become interested in activist hedge funds. I'm doing research on that. It turns out that an enlightened business leader of a public company can't necessarily pursue his enlightenment mm. or enlightenment. If, if she does, the hedge funds are going to come in. My, my colleague, Marc Desjardins, just has a paper coming out in SMJ. Uh, I think it's SMJ. He also has one coming out in AMJ. He's an expert on, on activist hedge funds. And this particular paper is, is all about how Activist hedge funds either deliberately or undeliberately target companies that have very high, highly positive CSR profiles on the assumption that they are leaving money on the table. That, so paper, that paper that you're mentioning, if, if people are, are interested in it, um, uh, I think it came out in one of the Academy's recent summaries of like, you know, what the, the papers that are recently published and that might have like a, some kind of a social or real world impact or whatever. Um, just this past week, uh, I think that came out. Um, so the Academy's got like a brief little article um, about that. It might have been AMJ then. Uh, yeah. Um, but Mark, Mark is terrific. And, uh, but anyhow, uh, these business leaders can't, can't, in a board, cannot unilaterally decide to pursue a balanced agenda. Mm -hmm. Ruth raised an issue, uh, Aguilera raised an issue here in the chat about what's the role of sustainable investors or socially responsible investors in all of this? Um, what, a, what a great question. And I think that they, potentially are a countervailing force uh, against uh, the activist hedge funds. Uh, actually, it'd be fascinating to sort of see uh, the degree to which sustainability, uh, uh, social, socially conscious investors and activist hedge funds who have very contradictory agendas. It'd be interesting to see the degree to which they steer clear of each other in their investment strategies, or uh, I can't imagine that they, it'd be interesting to see if they ever uh, are investment heavy in the same firm. Uh, that, that'd be a, a formula for uh, schizophrenia, I guess. 
but Ruth, I, I think we'll, I mean, we have, uh, well, I, I guess a couple of things go through my mind. We have this growing phenomenon of uh, B corporations, benefit corporations. Uh, we have more and more companies going private. I hope, I don't know how many of you elsewhere in the world know this, and many Americans don't know it, are not aware of it, but the number of public corporations in the U.S. has dropped by 50% in the last 25 years. There, uh, there are just not nearly as many public corporations as there used to be. Now, there's still 4,000, but there, there used to be 8,000, yeah. and uh, for various reasons, and some of it is to escape uh, some of these, uh, some of the torment and some of the, some of the short sightedness and pressures that come from the public markets and maybe, and especially activist hedge funds. So, um, Ann Sui is on this call as well, and she's asking about like some similar questions in this kind of space, business and society and the role of academia. Uh, and she said that, um, why can't we do social science that can change the world for the better? What are the obstacles that are in the way? Why can't we seem to do it? Well, and she said she all, can follow up if necessary. Yeah, first of all, let me just say hi to my dear friend, Anne. Uh, uh, thanks for being with us, Anne. Um, We probably ought to follow up, Anne. I'm, I'm not feeling very snappy at this moment. <laughs> uh, so why can't we do social science research that leads to change and improvement? And I would like to think that we can. Um, we should try. Um, I just, I don't know. And, and Anne, I don't know if you were on the call early on when I was bemoaning uh, the fact that academia in general has been sidelined uh, by society in the last few years. It's not, it's not just social science, it's uh, scientists of all stripes. And shame on us or wo woe to society because of this. It's just, it's it's grim so i think we ought to continue to fight the good fight and keep trying and maybe some young people maybe some of you on this call will help figure out how academia can reattain its voice mm. and how it how it can uh how it can uh, retain its legitimacy and uh, and have some impact. Who do we have? Who do we have to ally ourselves with? Uh, maybe, maybe I mean our, I think our our stance tends to be that we that we shouldn't ally ourselves with anybody. We're supposed to be totally independent. But if, I'm not sure that works. I'm not sure that has worked. So I'm, I I don't have a good answer, but except to say that. Uh, the question is superb, and I'm hoping that young people, including those on this call, can help figure out part of the answers. Well, Don, thank you for, for taking the question. Anyone can answer it, you can answer it. Um, you're already encouraging young people to take the, um, the, um, the charge and to um, uh, work on this problem. I guess I'm reacting to um, um, we are still teaching in many schools shareholder primacy model. In the business world, the way it is now, I think we contribute to that to some extent. I wouldn't blame it all on the business leaders. I think we are teaching our students, you only serve one master. And we don't talk about the world. So, so I'm questioning, we actually have the problem in our hands that we can do something about as a business school community. So the question is, how do we get a business school community to rise up to the occasion, to the call that we can contribute to a better world 
not only through our teaching, but also through our research. What problem we study, what solutions we find, and then teach our students that the world cannot sustain the way it is now. And we have to, working with our students and with ourselves, take this charge and, and, and move forward. I, 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 I hope that we don't all put it on the shoulders of our young people. <laughs> so so and, that's my thought. I'm welcome to be challenged. That's uh, certainly well, my naive thought. That's elo eloquent. And, uh, and I know that over the last few years, you've, you've thrown yourself into this agenda. And it's and uh, more power to you, and uh, yeah, I think that business schools have a, a, a role to play. And as you know, business schools themselves, and business school faculty and administration are, are not homogeneous in this regard, and so we have yes. uh, our own our own conflicts mm -hmm. right. about the, about the very issue that you're raising. But uh, I think you you and I and many of the people in, on this call and many people in the field of management. Uh, share, share your thoughts. <clears throat> so Don, I know, I know you're, you're getting tired. We've been peppering you with questions here for the last uh, uh, hour and a half. I've got one more question from Ruth uh, Aguilera and um, she had uh, a question for you and then I was going to finish after she's done, after you all are done with this, then kind of give you a softball uh, sort of at the end and, and, then, and then we'll, uh, and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll close the meeting. Uh, so, Ruth, batter up. Uh, hi, hi, Anne, and hi, Don. Uh, it's not really a question. It's like I was trying to put Don in a more maybe optimistic uh, light, <laughs> <laughs> in the you know uh, because he was in the sense that you know I don't think we are being marginalized, but I think and you're saying you know hopefully they'll listen to us. I think it's time for us to you know especially maybe not us you know maybe not me but definitely the younger people to have uh, you know, professional responsibility in the sense of being able to translate our research, being able to communicate, because we have li been living in a silo with these 40 page papers that an executive would never have time to read. So try to you know, uh, engage more and educate more. Uh, and this is very much in line with Anne, and I'm sure Don, you will agree, but I would say that everything that we do, then we have to go out there and translate it, you know, publish it in a law review, publish it in HBR, uh, do a blog. And, you know, Don knows that I was just listening to, you know, more accessible materials. And those are so helpful to also um, kind of educate the research. So I think it's very important that we get out of our silos of what we feel comfortable with, our big theories, you know, even though, I myself consider myself a big theorist uh, and go out there in the world and really look at the puzzles. And this is how Donna started today. Look at the puzzles in the world and see how we can help in a plain English, whether it's Chinese, Spanish or plain, and engage with those communities. So I, you know, I really, I know Don thinks very positively, but maybe that wasn't communicated in that way. Uh, so that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. That's, that's well put. Thanks, Ruth. And so the last, the last question uh, for you, and given that, you know, this is, uh, the STR division has helped uh, put this on, and, um, and obviously we all really value the Academy of Management and SMS and the other societies that we're in, and you've had a leadership role, right, uh, in, a lot of, in, a, in a lot of these organizations over the years. So I just wanted to give you a chance to sort of comment uh, here at the end about how the academy, maybe the SMS, maybe this division or whatever, has sort of helped shape your career uh, and, and any advice that you have for like junior scholars, um, doctoral students or whatever in this regard about the importance of these organizations and about how to get involved in them. Well, these organizations are uh, critical for us as scholars. They are, uh, the cornerstone for uh, our meaning as academic fields. Um, and so we, you ought to savor uh, the academy, savor SMS, and contribute to them. Uh, they are, they're critical. I became, uh, it's interesting, I became uh, involved in the academy as a young assistant professor in a very minor way, 
uh, and I got selected for another gig and another gig and another gig. And so you start in a minor way, uh, but it's, it's how you build your network and it's how you can, it's, an, it's a critically important form of service. Uh, and uh, I did, uh, I was the chair of uh, the strategy division back then, uh, very early in, in my career. I was, and then I, of course I became president, president of the academy beyond that. And all I can say is that being active in these organizations uh, helps to build, as I said, helps to build your network, helps to uh, give you a sense of, of extended colleagueship, helps you understand that you're part of something much bigger intellectually. So I, I encourage you all this to start in your own a uh, minor way uh, and and keep asking and keep in, keep uh, uh, demonstrating that uh, you're good at at, uh, at at these service contributions and you'll get picked to do bigger and bigger things and and I cannot say enough about how these are the basis for friendships uh, and sense of colleagues around the world. That's very, you know, very important. Ac academics, many academics, certainly myself included, are introverts. I'm, I am, I'm a real introvert, and so I don't, I don't gravitate to the social real easily. But, uh, but this was an area where I did, and I always loved it, and, uh, and. Uh, we, we need colleagues, we need co-authors, we need people to bounce our ideas off of, to do friendly reviews for us and so on and so forth. So uh, your, your service to the Academy is critically important and will be critically valuable for you. I agree. Um, and this, you, you meet people here that become co-authors, right? It's also a marketplace of ideas. Um, we're, you know, you heard Jay Barney talk about you know, using academy meetings over the years to sort of build up the idea that resources matter, you know, in, in a world at that time when people were focused on, you know, the IO economics perspective and things of that sort. And so uh, it really, really is important. And, um, and Don is a, a true gentleman in the field um, that has, uh, you know, that's, that's been a leader for a really, really long time um, in, in both the academy and also in the journals and, and with students and whatnot. And so, um, at the, uh, so that we don't wear him out too much more, um, I thought that uh, maybe I'm gonna ask uh, Eunice to grab some of the questions that are in the chat box, in other words, like save them and kind of put them in a file uh, for me. Um, and, uh, and then we can kind of, you know, figure out what to do about them and I don't wanna, load Don up with about a hundred emails to answer or whatever, but some of those may cover like some, uh, some common topics or whatever. We'll find a way to, you know, if we can, if we can, you know, find a way to, to address some of those later. Does that sound okay, Don? That's so great. You're not having, so you're not having to send 36 emails, but yeah, so, but if, I would, uh, so if you can, uh, can send me the, the, the chat, well, well, that'd be great. Can we do that? Can you, you send the chat? Yep. Okay. So it looks like we're going to be able to do that. Um, so everybody, thank you very much for logging on um, on your Wednesday afternoon or, or, uh, or, or was it maybe Thursday morning, depending on where you are in the world. Um, thank you very much. And most of all, Don, thank you. I mean, we, we peppered you with questions for a really, really long time and, and, uh, and, and you were outstanding, um, insightful, uh, candid, and we really, really appreciate it. Cannot tell you thank you enough. This is really, really beneficial. I don't think only, not only for the junior people, but also for the more senior people um, on the call. So very, very good job. Thank you very, very much. And, and we're really grateful to you for doing this. Thank you, thank you for letting me do it. All, All right. right.